Chapter 19, Diabetic Emergencies and Altered Mental Status. So this chapter is unique in the fact that it presents us with some very complex issues when evaluating patients. Uh, altered mental status in general really makes our, our job much more difficult because our patient isn't able to communicate effectively with us. They're not able to tell us what's wrong. We can't establish that chief complaint. Uh, we can't rule out things like allergies or medications. There's there's just a lot of uh, complex components to an altered mental status patient. So we're going to go through here today and we're going to talk about some of the things that can lead to an altered mental status and see if we can't rapidly identify it. Because at the end of the day, anybody that does have an altered mental status is most likely uh, giving you some type of hint or showing some signs or symptoms of a very serious underlying condition. So first and foremost, the pathophysiology of an altered mental status, the reticular activating system within the brain is what controls your consciousness. So when the brain, for whatever reason, is not perfused appropriately, it can impact that RAS. When the RAS is impacted, it can impact anything from uh, speech, uh, ability to comprehend things, uh, awakeness, right, whether or not a patient is conscious, semi-conscious, or unconscious, and everything in between. So it, it begins to show its signs and symptoms pretty quickly. Um, and what it is, is anytime the brain is unable to utilize oxygen, glucose, or water as needed, uh, we begin to see signs and symptoms uh, of the RAS being affected. That may also be uh, signs of anxiety at the very beginning there. You know, if you think about it, a patient who isn't able to breathe, right, they're having trouble breathing um, or they're not feeling well, something like that, that underlying sense of anxiety kicks in. And the big component there is the sim uh, stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. But that should be an indication that the reticular activating system is being compromised in one way or another. So looking at those three three things in red there, right, oxygen, glucose, and water. The brain must have sufficient quantities of each of those in order for it to, to uh, function properly. So when the oxygen is depleted, whether the patient is hypoxic or maybe they're just uh, uh, you know having a difficult time breathing, they're not exchanging gases appropriately, etc., uh, we can look at that as being one of the underlying causes. Glucose, if they are hypoglycemic, that can be an issue. And then obviously water. And when we talk about water, we're really referring to the, the quantity of uh, the blood volume that is circulating. So we need to make sure that we have an adequate blood volume along with the other components that make up a blood pressure, right? Uh, the heart needs to be beating effectively. We need to have proper uh, vessel tone, and we also need to have an adequate volume. And all those things need to come together to make sure that we have a perfusing blood pressure that is capable of pushing the oxygen and the glucose both out of the blood vessels and into the cells themselves. So in the instance that we have a patient with an altered mental status, the first thing we want to do is check those three things. And it's easy enough to look at their breathing quality. Are they breathing? Are they breathing well? Um, and, you know, is it shallow? Is it deep? Is it too fast? Too slow? We could throw the SpO2 monitor on them. Uh, if we have uh, end tidal CO2 capabilities, we could check capno uh, capnography. We could quickly assess their glucose, and glucose is something that uh, some people feel that glucose checks should be part of your um, your vital sign checks at all times, and I disagree with that. Although a glucose check is valuable, it's not needed on the vast majority of your patients. If your patient is a diabetic, or if they're altered, or if they've been involved in a trauma, or some other serious medical condition, we should be assessing glucose. But your general patient who stubbed their toe um, or your patient that's having um, some basic abdominal pain, you know, those are the types of things where it, it doesn't hurt. You don't have to not check it, but you don't necessarily need to check it at the same time. Uh, and then from there, we go and check water. And the best way to check water is to actually assess their blood pressure. We can look at the regularity of their heart rate, um, the strength of each of their pulses, stuff like that. Trauma and infection, uh, it says chemical toxins there, which would be things like drug use, uh, alcohol, those are all included. Those are all underlying conditions that can contribute to an altered mental status as well. Uh, and then obviously we have things like the stroke um, that we're going to talk a lot about today. So lots of potential causes, and because all of these are very serious conditions, we have to quickly be able to rule them out.
One of the biggest takeaways here is that a patient with an altered mental status has the potential to be combative, uh, and not because they are purposely being aggressive, but because the, that altered mental status is impairing their ability to make good conscious decisions. And as a result, uh, they go into kind of a, a protective measure there, and they can have actions that are otherwise uncontrollable. A good example is a patient I had one time that was a diabetic, and he was hypoglycemic, and we were working to try to start an IV to give him dextrose, which is a, um, it's essentially a sugar, uh, sugar water that we can administer IV. And during this time, he was incredibly combative. And it got to the point that we were having to hold him down. One person was holding his forearm, another person was holding his upper arm, and I was trying to get the IV established in between there. And I was getting frustrated because he was, he was just relentlessly fighting back against us. And I said, hey, hold still, I'm trying to help you. And his response was, I can't. And that just goes to show that in that situation there, because the brain wasn't being perfused properly, he was able to listen to and process what I said. He was even able to respond to us, but he lost control of muscle function at that point. His brain was doing something other than what it knew it should be doing. Uh, and these are the types of things that we're going to run into on a regular basis. You know, think about your elderly woman. She weighs 100 pounds soaking wet, and she's hypoxic because of an underlying respiratory issue. She could become combative. That same patient with a stroke may be combative. And that's going to be especially difficult because now we're going to be um, poised with the, the potential to need to restrain these patients. And, you know, restraining a, a male adult is a lot easier to uh, accept than having to restrain or tie down a geriatric patient. So these are things that we have to just kind of be prepared for. Uh, but at the end of the day, we still have to treat our patients. We have to protect them and ourselves. And sometimes that's going to include the use of force maybe even utilizing law enforcement as a resource there. So when we're assessing a patient with an altered mental status, uh, first and foremost, we should never become complacent or allow tunnel vision to, to get in our way. And in this situation here, this is a great example. If we were to walk into a manufacturing facility and we see somebody laying on the ground, uh, that, that's great, right? We're looking at the patient, we're forming our general impression, and we're starting to think about things that could be causing this condition. But what we're not doing right now is looking at the big picture around us. And, you know, is this an altered mental status patient due to a medical condition? Or is this a trauma? Uh, is this a workplace violence issue? Um, could there be chemicals? You know, what type of manufacturing or industrial facility are we dealing with here? So make sure that you're always doing a great job of sizing up the scene. Even though these patients are very serious, we need to look at the big picture before we narrow down and focus in on the patient specifically. Knowing that hypoxia is one of the most common causes of altered mental status, uh, it's also e one of the easiest to fix. If somebody is hypoxic, it's real simple. We put them on oxygen. And if they're hypoxic because they're not breathing effectively on their own, it's pretty simple. We breathe for them, right? We get that BVM out and we do the job. So these are pretty simple. And being able to quickly identify these underlying causes and come up with easy treatment plans is going to be in the best interest of your patient. From there then, as we perform the primary assessment, right, we're looking at general impression. We can't get a chief complaint because they're altered, so we're going to run in through um, the ABCs or CAB, depending on how altered they may be. And we're going to look for those life-threatening problems. You know, if they're altered and they have this life-threatening hemorrhage, well, the problem is their blood pressure is probably too low. Um, they have lost a lot of their red blood cells, so therefore they've lost their oxygen carrying capabilities. And as a result, they're not perfusing things well. So what should we do to try to address this? Apply pressure, stop the, the wound, or uh, stop the bleeding, and then put them on oxygen to try to make sure that whatever red blood cells they do have left circulating in the body are maximized or as saturated as they can be uh, with the oxygen that they have available. Uh, from there, then we look at other underlying uh, life threats. You know, do we need to reposition their airway? Do we need to suction these patients? Um, you know, what are their, you know, what are their uh, perfusion parameters, uh, skin parameters? What's their pulse rate? Is it regular? Is it irregular? Too fast? Too slow? Et cetera. Then we move into our secondary assessment. So our secondary assessment would include things like vital signs and our head to toe. Right, the head to toe on this altered mental status patient 
is going to help us to identify the potential for injuries or, or something like that. But now the vital signs, and we've talked a lot about how vital signs are never going to tell you what's wrong with the patient. And that's the truth, right? They, they won't. They should never be your priority. But in the instance of having a patient with an altered mental status, obtaining a quick SpO2, uh, obtaining a blood glucose, and getting a blood pressure, all three of those things in, uh, in, short, in a short time after you get to the patient will tell you the most about the potential cause for this altered mental status. Now what we have to be careful with there is if we identify them to be hypotensive and we decide that, okay, their blood pressure is 60 over 40 and that's why they're altered. That's fine, but we haven't identified what's actually wrong with them, right? What's causing this blood pressure to be so low? Are they bleeding? Do they have an internal bleed somewhere? Um, is there, uh, do they overdose on a medication? You know, and by simply focusing on the altered mental status and the, and the uh, root cause of the altered mental status, you know, we need to look beyond the, the basic signs and symptoms. So all this is going to do by getting our glucose, our SpO2, and our blood pressure right away, it's going to give us an idea of what may be contributing, but it won't give us that root cause. So here we go. We have a patient with an altered mental status. She pre presents what looks to be a little pale. The uh, care provider here is, is assessing the radial pulse. So if we have a good, strong radial pulse, we know that their blood pressure should be sufficient to perfuse all the vital organs. So we can quickly rule out blood pressure. From here, though, uh, just based on the presentation, she doesn't look cyanotic. She's not tripoding. My guess would be this is probably going to be some type of sugar issue. So that would be my next go-to is checking her blood sugar. From there then, a body systems exam, you know, we're going to do that complete comprehensive assessment. Because these patients can't tell us what's wrong, we have to try to figure it out for ourselves. And that means doing that good detailed head-to-toe, looking for any potential clues as to what might be going on. Beyond that, if we do have uh, family members or care providers or any other witnesses that can provide us with information, you know, that's going to be useful in determining what's going on. Um, but at the end of the day, we may even have to look around the house. You know, a common place to keep medical information is on the refrigerator. And that's actually something we tell a lot of our, our patients to do. They carry what's called a file of life. And that file of life is just a little magnetic pouch and allows them to uh, write on a card with their medical history, their medications, their allergies, etc. And that's something that we can go and grab and try to clue us in as to what might be going on. Uh, we can look at their medications themselves. We can go into the bathroom, the bedroom, the kitchen, wherever they've got their meds, start looking at the medications that they're taking, and that should clue us in as to some underlying medical conditions as well. Beyond that, we have the medical alert bracelets. Don't forget those. Uh, and we know the kids are not going to be good historians. You know, they're not going to be able to answer questions as well as we'd like them to, especially if they're altered. So referring back to a mom or dad or a caregiver is going to be really important. All right, moving into diabetes then. Diabetes is an emergency that we deal with on a regular basis. Having a good understanding of diabetes and how it affects the body is gonna be very valuable as you go into patient care. So first and foremost, we said that water, oxygen, and glucose were the three things that the brain needs in order to function properly. So with diabetes, this is gonna be a glucose issue. And what glucose is, it's a form of sugar in the body that circulates throughout the bloodstream and then that can be utilized by the cells along with the oxygen to create adenosine triphosphate or create energy right and that's what helps us to to function each and every day that's what keeps us alive so we have to have uh, glucose and we have to have a sufficient amount of glucose available the thing about glucose is that the molecule itself is relatively large so therefore it is too large to just kind of permeate through the cell wall on its own and as a result, it utilizes something called active transport. And that active transport utilizes insulin. Insulin is then produced by the pancreas. It's pumped into the bloodstream. And then that insulin binds itself to the cells. And then it kind of opens up a little uh, door, if you will, into the cell, allowing that larger uh, glucose molecule to enter. So the production of insulin by the pancreas is going to be super important. We know that we have two different types of diabetics that we'll talk about in a second, type 1, type 2. And type 1 does not utilize insulin appropriately. 
So therefore, that glucose that is, is floating through the, the blood vessels is unable to be absorbed and used for, um, used for energy purposes. So a little bit more on the type 1. In the event that they aren't producing enough insulin or not the right, uh, or not no insulin at all for that matter, then what ends up happening is our blood sugar levels can be perfectly fine. As a matter of fact, the blood sugar levels will probably continue to rise, but the patient is still appearing to be altered for whatever reason. And that's because they're not able to utilize those sugars. So when we identify that a patient may be altered and they may be a diabetic, just because their blood sugar level is within a normal range or even a little high doesn't necessarily mean anything. Now, when we deal with diabetics in the EMS, um, EMS profession, more often than not, we're dealing with a patient that becomes hypoglycemic, meaning that their blood sugar level drops. And that happens quite frequently. In the instance of a type 1 diabetic, they take insulin, right? They take synthetic insulin as a medication that uh, replaces the insulin that the pancreas is not producing. And sometimes they'll take insulin in the morning and then they'll forget to eat. So since the body typically produces insulin uh, and it only produces enough insulin to match the amount of sugar that's in the bloodstream, then it, you know, it all balances out. But if a patient takes synthetic insulin and then forgets to eat, that insulin exists no matter what. So what little sugar is in the bloodstream, that insulin is going to start to process and utilize. And as a result, their, their blood sugar level will start to drop relatively quickly. And when a patient's sugar level drops, uh, that is going to be a true life-threatening emergency that we have to rapidly identify and treat. In type 2 diabetics, then, uh, their body produces insulin, but the cells are not utilizing it appropriately. So in a type 1, it's really an issue with the pancreas. The pancreatic cells are not producing the insulin it's supposed to uh, be producing. And in type 2, it's more of a uh, just a general cellular issue where the cells themselves are unable to utilize the insulin that's being produced. So in that circumstance, uh, patients will often take medications that will assist in the use of the glucose, right? And it'll allow that insulin to uh, be utilized by the cells themselves. And uh, a lot of times this can even be controlled simply with appropriate diet. Now here's the challenge. With these patients, although they're on medications, it's still very reasonable for their sugar levels to drop relatively quickly. So what we have to do is no matter whether it's a type 1, type 2 diabetic, quickly identify the altered mental status, uh, assess that blood sugar, and then treat it as necessary. We just briefly talked about a couple of the things that could lead to a hypoglycemic patient. Keep in mind that it's even something as simple as a patient who may be ill, right? If that patient is sick, especially with something like a stomach bug, not only is their body utilizing sugar faster as their immune system is trying to fight things off, but if they're vomiting or if they're unable to eat, those things could contribute to those lower blood sugars as well. And this is where we have to look even beyond the, the diabetic patients. Patients who are not diabetic, but they are extremely ill or even injured. As the body tries to repair itself, uh, it utilizes a lot of sugar in, in their energy production there. So if a patient is ill for a period of time and they're unable to eat for whatever reason, then we can start to see some, di some diabetic-related issues there. And we may have to treat those patients with sugar even though they don't have a, a long-standing diagnosis of diabetes. With hypoglycemia, it comes on relatively quickly. It could be over the course of minutes or even hours. just depends on the, the patient's production or energy production levels. And they're become, going to become pale, sweaty, tachycardic. Uh, their breathing could be increased. They could even have seizures. Now, I want you to look at those things and ask why. You know, don't just simply memorize those, but think to yourself. Why would a patient who's hypoglycemic, if their blood sugar is low, why is it that they would present pale or sweaty for that matter? Well, let's think about this. If their sugar level is low, the body is going to need, a, need what little sugar that they have to try to perfuse the most vital of organs. So those vital organs being the heart, the lungs, the brain, etc., it shunts the blood that it has in toward the core. And it's trying to hoard as much of the, the sugar as possible in toward the core of the body to perfuse those vital organs. So as a result, perfusing the skin is no longer a priority. And since we have that peripheral vasoconstriction, 
as it shunts all the blood in toward the core of the body. The rest of the body, the, the skin and everything else, presents pale. And because the skin's not being perfused adequately, it becomes relatively porous, and you'll start to see them appear uh, clammy or even sweaty. The tachycardia is indicative of the same thing. So as we aren't able to secure enough sugar, it's important that we quickly try to circulate what little sugar we have in order to, again, perfuse those vital organs. Rapid breathing, if our heart rate goes up in an attempt to try to, um, to, to compensate there, right, circulate what little sugar we have, then because of the, the ventilation perfusion match, we should start to see an increase in respiratory rate as well. Seizures are going to be indicative, and we'll talk about seizures in this chapter yet, uh, but those are going to be indicative of any time the brain is not being perfused well. So if you have a hypoglycemic patient that is seizing, they've probably been uh, hypoglycemic for quite some time, and they're definitely in, in very serious condition. And this, again, just reiterates everything we just talked about, right? If the brain's not being perfused, it becomes altered, and it's typically going to be a result of either a lack of water, glucose, or oxygen. So what about when the sugar level goes high? And in the, those situations, this is a, a more gradual onset. It doesn't typically happen over the course of hours. Uh, usually it won't even happen over the course of a day or two. This is going to be multiple days or even into weeks that the sugar level is going to continue to increase. And there's a lot of different uh, causes for this. But um, you know, regardless of what the potential underlying causes are, these patients are going to present very ill. Usually these patients will have reported to a, their doctor or the ER on their own prior to having to call EMS, but we do run into these from time to time. Since we're not overly concerned with what caused the hyperglycemia, right, because that's something they're going to have to work out with their doctors and everything else, we just want to know well, what are the signs and symptoms we should be looking for to identify the hyperglycemia in addition to uh, just simply checking the blood sugar? And the thing is with these patients, they may not present altered whatsoever. They may be acting completely normal, just very sick. So we have to be able to look at things to clue us into, hey, this could be still an issue with their sugar. We should be assessing their glucose and treating it as necessary. So looking at this here, chronic thirst and hunger increased urination. So those type of or those two things kind of go opposite of what you would think they should be, right? What ends up happening is although there is an incredible amount of sugar circulating throughout the body here, um, the sugar is not being used by the cells. So the cells feel like they are starved. As a result, your body tells it tells you that it's hungry. It says, hey, you know, we're not getting enough sugar here. We're starving. Eat more food, get us more sugar, and it tries to continue to, to build. As a result, since the circulating sugar isn't been, being used appropriately and you continue to eat more and more, the sugar level continues to increase. Now, as your kidneys are filtering out your blood, it realizes that you've got way too much sugar in there. So one of the great ways that we balance out and get rid of excess of anything is through urination. So now you start urinating a lot more. But of course, you're urinating. You've got your sugar levels are too high, so now you feel super dehydrated. So, of course, the patient will become thirsty, right? And all these things just kind of, you know, they, they play out together um, where they build on top of each other. And, of course, for everything that, that pops up here, it's just making our patient's condition worse and worse. Okay, so there you go. There's our, our uh, result of profound dehydration. So for this patient, talking about the things that cause altered mental status, right, it may or may not necessarily be the sugar level that causes them to become altered, but maybe it's the hypotension, right? That low blood pressure that results from the profound um, dehydration here. We also have something called diabetic ketoacidosis, and that's where the sugar levels develop uh, so high and those ketones start to form, causing a, a very acidic state for the patient. And we know that the, the body itself needs to remain relatively neutral. We don't want the patient to become extremely acidic or alkalotic either direction there. So uh, when that happens, again, we can start to see a lot of uh, very severe consequences. The diabetic ketoacidosis here will eventually, or most likely, I should say, lead to shock. Um, and that, again, is from the dehydration itself. Uh, rapid breathing and the acetone odor. So this is that fruity odor that almost smells like alcohol. 
And this is really the, the root cause that um, police officers no longer just simply take people to the drunk tank and let them sleep it off. Anytime they're pre presenting uh, grossly altered and they smell like they have alcohol on their breath, um, there's the potential that it could be a diabetic emergency. So they typically call us to do an evaluation before they make any determinations on what to do with this, this patient. The acetones that are developed, it's the ketones really, in the, the blood, um, one of the ways that we try to get rid of those excess ketones is by uh, exhaling them or breathing them off. And as that happens, each breath smells like alcohol. It's that very fruity flavor. And uh, as a result there, it may seem like the patient is just simply drunk, but in fact it's a, a hyperglycemic issue and they are potentially at risk of death at this point. So when we're dealing with our, our uh, diabetic patients, as with anybody else, you know, you're seeing safety, do a good uh, primary assessment, and then do a good uh, secondary assessment. And your treatment, of course, for hypoglycemia is going to be to administer sugar. And if it is hyperglycemia, uh, rapid transport or a request ALS. So looking at this here, when we assess our blood glucose around our patients, what we're looking for is a, a numeric reading that's measured in milligrams per deciliter. Okay. And the normal range is between 80 and 120. But our patients can operate outside of that range marginally uh, without any real big consequences. Uh, typically, a patient who's between 70 and 80, if they're not showing any signs or symptoms, that's not overly concerning. Um, if they are a diabetic, we probably have them eat a sandwich or something just to kind of get their sugar level up a little bit. If it drops below 70, now we have to start really worrying about it. We look at their presentation. Are they altered? Are they acting funny? You know, are their vitals within normal limits? Um, and we're looking at that to determine how or, or if we're going to treat the patient. If it's below 60 and they're still conscious and talking and able to follow commands, have them eat. The best thing they can do is eat. And if, if it's a matter of making a sandwich, eating a candy bar, or simply taking a tube of oral glucose, any of those things would be equally appropriate. It does uh, from time to time they'll become complicated as their sugar level drops even lower than that. And when it does drop lower than that and they become altered to the point that they're unable to follow commands, those are the instances where administering glucagon may be appropriate. Now what happens when it goes up, right? We said 120 is kind of the top of the normal range. Anything above 140 is where we start getting quasi-concerned. But I'll be honest with you, uh, if you were to take my blood sugar after a good Thanksgiving meal, uh, or even Christmas time after uh, gorging on the, the uh, big platter of Christmas cookies, it's probably going to be above 140. Okay, um, and in those situations, it's really not the end of the world. But as it does continue to increase, and especially when we get up, you know, 200, 300, or even higher than that, those are the issue or the patients that we can really start to see some pretty profound problems, including that dehydration there. From time to time, their sugar levels are so far out of whack that the monitor can't even read a numeric value, and it'll just simply say high or low. And depending on the monitor you have, it, it'll have different ranges. You know, it says here that it's typically going to be above 500 or below 15, uh, but each monitor has its own specific ranges. So be familiar with that, depending on the monitor that you're using. All right, oral glucose then. Probably one of the easiest medications we have. It's real simple. Nobody's allergic to it. You squeeze it in their mouth. You let allow it to absorb either through the mucous membranes in the cheek or under the tongue. Those routes are considered uh, called buccal and sublingual, respectively. Or the patient may also swallow it and allow it to be absorbed through the di uh, digestive system. Any of those would be appropriate, and all of them are effective. The thing about oral glucose, though, is it does take a little while for it to get absorbed and for it to actually begin to work. Uh, so this patient may not start to come around for 10 minutes or more. When we're on scene dealing with diabetic patients, knowing that a lot of times they're not going to want to be transported, they're going to want to sign off, um, our scene times here may easily be 30 or even 45 minutes. And uh, that's just something that we have to kind of deal with. You know, these patients can easily be treated. Um, they're not going to want to go to the hospital every time their sugar level, you know, drops off a little bit. And as a result, we're going to stay on scene and provide them that level of care. Uh, once we administer it, because it's a drug, we have to uh, reassess. And from there, as long as their sugar level is up where we want it to be, 
we're fine. If we can't get it to rise, we may have to consider transport then. So the big differences here between hypo and hyperglycemia compared, hypoglycemia is a rapid onset, whereas hyperglycemia is a slower onset. With hypoglycemia, the patient's going to be cool and clammy and pale. With hyperglycemia, they're probably going to be warm, red, and uh, flushed. Breathing for the hyperglycemic uh, patient is going to be uh, relatively rapid, and we're going to have that fruity flavor, but not necessarily. And then with the hypoglycemic patients, the respiratory function may be increased a little bit, but we're, we should not have any of that, uh, that fruity flavor at all. All right, now we're going to move into some other causes of altered mental status. Sepsis. Sepsis has become something that is really at the forefront of our attention these days. Uh, through a bunch of studies, what the hospitals were realizing is that a lot of patients were coming into the hospital in a septic uh, state, and it was not being immediately recognized. And the long-term prognosis for patients who enter into a septic state is not very good. Even simple infections that turn into sepsis can be uh, life-threatening, or they can have long-term deficits. So as a result, we've really started to look at signs and symptoms of sepsis. We now better understand and respect the consequences of sepsis, and we're working to treat those patients a lot quicker and more aggressively. So in the instance of sepsis, right, it is a systemic infection that causes the patient to go into shock. Septic shock is one of the types of shock that we recognize. And as with most other types of shock, we see very common signs and symptoms. Altered mental status, depending on the, uh, the progression of it, whether or not they're compensated or decompensated. But we'll see the increase in heart rate and respiratory rate as the body tries to compensate. And over time, as the compensatory responses of the heart rate and respiratory rate uh, are no longer sufficient, we'll start to see the blood pressure drop. Okay? Um, their blood glucose could be high because they're trying to utilize as much glucose as they can to meet the, uh, the needs of the immune system and try to fight off the infection. Their cap refill time would be decreased just simply because of the lower blood pressure. So really anytime our patient has any vital signs that would suggest some of the things that are up there and they have a fever or recent history of infection, a pneumonia, uh, even something as simple as a, as a UTI, all of those things can lead to a septic condition. So we need to quickly recognize that make sure we're getting them to the appropriate facilities. These patients are almost always guaranteed to be admitted. Uh, they're going to probably receive high dose IV antibiotics. And depending on the level of impairment with the respiratory function, they could even be intubated for a period of time. So again, we have to really quickly uh, recognize this and make sure we get them to the appropriate facility. Seizure disorders, similar to diabetes, is oftentimes a diagnosed situation. Uh, it's an illness and patients that uh, have learned to live with it over time and aren't necessarily going to be life-threatening. It's the patients who are having seizures that don't have a diagnosis of epilepsy or something like that that we really begin to get concerned about because a seizure is, a, is an indication that the brain is really upset about something. Maybe it's not being perfused, maybe it's injured, but something is wrong with the brain and obviously that's going to be a, a big concern for us as care providers. So when the brain recognizes that there's something going on that's wrong, uh, it will go into the seizure state. And that seizure state, while it is a response to a negative thing, is almost in a way a, a protective measure because it'll shut itself down and then it slowly begins to reboot itself, similar to that of a computer. And we'll talk about the different stages and, and how we can start to identify and even treat some of those stages. So we have two different uh, types of seizures. You have a partial seizure and you have a generalized seizure. The generalized seizure is what you're you're used to seeing on TV, right? Patient falls down, they begin convulsing, all, their, all the muscles in their body are shaking. That's a generalized seizure, something we call a grand mal. We also have a partial seizure. And in a partial seizure, that's going to be uh, limited to likely just a certain area of the body. It may or may not um, be associated with a loss of consciousness, right? I could theoretically be sitting here and talking to you right now, and I could have a seizure, you know, focused in, in just my arm or something. Maybe my eye is twitching, right? Uh, those are all forms of small or partial seizures that don't necessarily include a, 
a loss of consciousness. When we have a grand mal or a generalized seizure, it can be classified into two separate uh, stages. We have the tonic and the clonic phases then. So the tonic phase is when the body becomes very rigid. And we oftentimes don't even recognize this tonic phase because it's very short-lived. says here up to 30 seconds, but in reality, the tonic phase is probably no more than 5 to 6 seconds. And what happens is as, as a patient is maybe walking along or as they're sitting somewhere, their entire body tenses up really stiff. And then after that tense phase for a few seconds, it goes into those, those convulsions or the jerking uh, motions. And that jerking motion is considered the clonic phase. And that can last for any period of time here. It says for one to two minutes, but in reality, it could last for, for 10 minutes, 30 minutes. I've had a patient that, had a, that was in the clonic phase for an excess of 30 minutes. Now, they had a diagnosed uh, seizure disorder, but still, any time that we're in either the tonic or clonic phase, we are not breathing efficiently. Our perfusion is impaired. And we're having the, or we see the potential for some pretty significant consequences to the body there. Once it goes through the tonic and the phonic, uh, clonic phases, we go into what's called postictal. And the postictal is kind of the reboot period of a computer, right? So as we turn on a computer and we, it goes through all of its startup processes, and we know that it, you know, it runs a little slow for the first minute or two until everything's really working like it should, that's the same thing as what happens with the brain here in the postictal phase. Uh, the brain slowly starts to reboot. Everything starts to fire back up. Immediately following the clonic phase, the patient may not be breathing at all, but within a few seconds, they'll start breathing somewhat. Those respirations may be agonal, um, and we may have to assist with ventilations for a period of time as the patient continues to come out of their seizure. Remember that this postictal phase could last a minute or two, or I've even seen them last, uh, even the postictal phase itself, in excess of uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So um, the extent to which we have to care for our patient is dependent on how long it takes. And our care provided during the postictal phase is really no different than any other patient. We identify signs and symptoms that are abnormal and we treat them appropriately, whether it be ventilations or simply supplemental oxygen via nasal cannula or mask. If the patient has vomit or blood in their airway, we're going to suction it. Um, our, our patient care here really does not change at all. Some seizures are preceded by an, uh, an aura and patients who have seizure disorders, they may get a certain smell or taste or a visual disturbance that clues them into the fact that they're going to have a seizure. And the benefit to that is if somebody's walking down the street, they're able to quickly stop, sit down, or even lay down so that when that seizure comes on, you know, they don't all of a sudden you know, fall down and hit their head. And now we're dealing with a trauma on top of the, the seizure issues themselves. Causes of a seizure are related to any type of uh, hypoperfusion of the brain consider, or caused by any one of the things that are listed up here, right? Um, even though toxins may not result in a hypoperfusion, simply putting the toxins or the poisons into the brain cells could be enough to put the patient into a seizure state. We also have a few other things here um, that are less acute. These are going to be are going to be more chronic, right? Things like brain tumors metabolic issues, uh, infection, and then idiopathic means unknown, right? Something causes seizure, we don't know what it is, and there's nothing we can do to try to prevent it in the future. Although those are rare, um, you can only begin to imagine how frustrating that might, must be for the patient to know that they had a seizure and they don't really know why. When we get into the OB chapters, we'll talk about something called preeclampsia and eclampsia, and that's a hypertension in pregnant women. So that could actually lead to a seizure. Heat stroke we'll talk about in the environmental emergencies chapter. Um, and then we also have some underlying communicable diseases that could lead to it as well. When we are treating a patient that had a seizure, some simple things. What were they doing beforehand? Um, we want to make sure that the seizure itself didn't cause trauma. But at the same time, we want to know that trauma didn't cause a seizure because it could be one way or another. Um, so was the patient playing football and they, you know, got a bad concussion? Maybe now they have a head bleed. Uh, was this an elderly patient who, you know, tripped on a rug at home, fell and hit their head last night, and now they're seizing? Or, you know, was the patient awake, sitting at their desk, working, no problem, and all of a sudden 
you know, fell to the floor and started to seize. So these things kind of clue us into not just the seizure, but what else could be contributing here? What else could be going on or what else could be wrong with our patient? We want to know how long did the seizure last? You know, the, the longer the seizure, the more time that they're not perfusing adequately, they're not breathing appropriately, and obviously the more potential damage we could have to certain organs. What did the person do after the seizure? So typically, if it's a tonic-clonic or that generalized seizure, they're not going to do anything. They're going to lay there and they're going to slowly begin to regain consciousness and their basic physiologic functions will slowly start to restore. But there are times where a patient can have this tonic-clonic seizure. They go into a postictal state for maybe a minute or two. And before they fully regain consciousness, they go back into another seizure. That's something we call status epilepticus. That's ex especially dangerous. So we have something that's causing multiple consecutive seizures. And since they've never, they never fully came out of that, uh, that postictal phase, we know that, again, perfusion of vital organs will be delayed even more. Treatment of the patient, if they are actively seizing in front of you, we just want to have them in a comfortable position where they're not at risk of hurting themselves. If it's on your cot, that's fine. If it's on the floor, no big deal. Um, just make sure that you know we're, we're protecting the patient. You know, talking about restri loosening restrictive clothing and stuff like that, you know, it's really not necessary. You know, if the patient is wearing a necktie and it's cinched down and it's strangling them, sure, loosen it up. But generally speaking, you know, the clothing really shouldn't be an issue there. Um, what we want to do is place them into a recovery position if possible, and that way if it, uh, there's any vomit or, or bleeding as a result of biting their tongue or something else, that will uh, drain out the side and not go back into the posterior pharynx blocking the airway or causing any aspiration risks. Uh, once the convulsions have ended, we assess our patient and we treat the signs and symptoms that we identify just like we would anybody else. If they're not breathing uh, adequately, we breathe for them. If they're labored and they are hypoxic, we're going to give them oxygen. If their airway is occluded, we're going to reposition it. And a good example of this is we responded for a child, and the child I believe was two or three years old, that had a seizure and uh, was not breathing. And we got there, and Dad was very freaked out. Mom wasn't home. Dad was there. Dad was freaked out. Did the right thing by calling 911. But when the kid fell and had the seizure, um, the position in which the kid fell, kind of their head was resting up against the front edge of the couch there. So what happened is it, it pushed the airway forward. Well, since the kid was postictal, um, it occluded the airway. The kid couldn't reposition its own airway. And as, as a result, the kid was not breathing. We got there. We pulled the kid away from the couch. We opened up the airway. I honestly think I gave him two or three uh, bags, and that's it. And then with that, he started breathing on his own. So, um, so simply looking at things like a positional asphyxia following a seizure uh, would be important, and it's an easy fix. And then from there, obviously, we want to transport these patients. From time to time, we will have an epileptic patient that will come back and say, no, I don't want to go to the hospital. I have these all the time. Just leave me alone. And if that's the case, as long as they're alert and oriented and decisional, willing to sign their refusal paperwork and you contact medical control, that's not a problem to let them sign off. Status epilepticus I mentioned a few minutes ago, and that's essentially when you have those multiple uh, seizures con uh, contiguously in a row there without the patient fully regaining consciousness in between. Remember that not all seizures are generalized tonic-clonic. We also have those partial seizures that would be localized to a specific area of the body, but the patient remains full, fully alert throughout that time. Uh, another type of generalized beyond the tonic-clonic would also be an absence seizure. And in those situations, the patient uh, doesn't be necessarily convulse or anything, but they may momentarily lose consciousness. Um, and that may be some something as simple as staring off into space, or it could be, you know, just literally falling, falling asleep or going unconscious for a period of time. Uh, more often than not, though, these things only last a few seconds, and they are not associated with the postictal phase. So they're a lot uh, more difficult to recognize. Uh, even technically, deja vu is considered a form of a seizure, believe it or not. Um, and it's just a, a mental disturbance is all. Strokes. Strokes we hear about quite often. Probably one of the more life-threatening issues that we deal with. Um, and although not all strokes are going to be life-threatening, all strokes have the potential to cause uh, real changes in the patient's livelihood, right? We want them to make sure that they 
maintain a quality of life um, as either the same or as close to the same as, as they had before the stroke. So with strokes, this is probably our most time sensitive issue. Once we identify that the patient is potentially having a stroke, the only thing we should be doing is driving to the hospital at that point. All of our interventions should be done in the back of the ambulance while it's moving. A stroke is just simply a blockage or um, something going on within the brain that does not allow a section of the brain to be perfused. It could be a clot or it could be an aneurysm and no different than a heart attack. Um, you know, if a clot gets lodged in the heart, it's a heart attack. If it gets lodged in the lungs, it's a pulmonary embolism. And if it gets lodged in the, in the brain, it's a stroke. And that clot can originate from anywhere in the body. It's just a matter of where the clot itself ends up lodging itself at the end. So signs and symptoms of a stroke are going to be neurologic in nature. We're going to see things where depending on, on the location of the stroke, you know, what part of the brain is being affected, uh, we'll see different presentations. Sometimes people simply have headaches. Sometimes you have the, the traditional, you know, uh, one-sided weakness, facial droop. Um, you'll see, uh, um, you know, altered mental status. They'll be unable to think. I almost feel like I'm having a stroke right now because I can't seem to get the words to roll off my tongue like I want to. Uh, ironically, that's a term that we call aphasia. I promise you, though, I'm not actually stroking right now. Beyond that, then, again, anything that we can identify to be neurological. So uh, dizziness, numbness, weakness, any of those things, paralysis can all be a part of it. Um, blood pressure will typically increase here, and that's one of the signs of a stroke. So not only will they have an altered mental status potentially, or will they have that you know single-sided weakness or, or neuro deficit, but their high blood pressure is also going to be a sign. And the reason is the brain uh, takes action to try to vasoconstrict and try to increase the blood pressure to the brain as much as possible. And the thought process behind that is since the brain isn't being perfused at the time of the stroke, or at least a section of the brain isn't, by increasing the blood pressure, it's trying to overcome whatever obstacle is, is you know preventing that perfusion and trying to get that perfusion to actually occur there. Uh, there's lots of other signs and symptoms. Look through these things here. We'll talk about this a lot more in class. Uh, there are so many potential signs and symptoms of a stroke, and, and unfortunately, no two strokes present alike. Um, we have to be very cognizant of all of these potential issues here, and even the presentation of one subtle issue uh, may all be maybe the only thing that we're able to, to gather, and that's what we have to base our differential diagnosis on. When we're communicating with the stroke patient, two things. It's super important that we do communicate, that we are talking to them, that we're reassuring them, even if they're unable to communicate back with us. If our patient is unconscious, it doesn't matter. In most situations, they're still able to hear what's going on. They're still aware. They're just unable to wake up and respond. And imagine how how uncomfortable that would be for you. And you know, a great story of this is one of the guys that uh, I work with, his last name is Cook. We call him Cookie. And during a stroke call, um, the crew was working in the back of the ambulance and it was, hey, Cookie, can you do this? Hey, Cookie, would you grab me this? Whatever the, you know, whatever it is that they were talking about. And fortunately, this guy had a positive outcome. He had a full recovery. And a period of time after the call, he came into the station to say thank you. And when he came in, he brought cookies. And he said, I don't know what it is that you guys, you know, what your obsession with cookies is, but that's all I remember you talking about during this whole thing were, were cookies. Now, as far as they were concerned, you know, he was uh, completely unconscious. You know, he was not responding to them or anything else. Um, and they were just simply saying, you know, cookie, referring to a person. But he heard that. He remembered it to the point that he even brought cookies in for them down the road. So kind of a neat story there. Uh, but it just reinforces the fact that we should be talking to our patients and though even though they're not talking back they're listening and they're scared and we should be reassuring them we should be telling them everything that we're doing so a stroke sometimes can be what's called a transient ischemic attack or a TIA and in a TIA it is a stroke all right a TIA is a stroke the difference is you know, the clot that causes the stroke sometimes will either break apart or, or get dislodged or whatever the case may be. So the symptoms of this TIA may resolve. And a lot of times what we'll get is we'll get called for a stroke and the family will describe, yeah, you know, I was here talking to mom and she's all of a sudden, 
started slurring her speech and she got really weak and she slumped to one side and she wasn't answering questions appropriately so we called 911 and we get there a few minutes later and she's acting fine and the signs and symptoms of these TIAs can re resolve you know within a couple minutes or even maybe within a few hours and uh, you know as long as the symptoms resolve that's a good sign it says that hopefully that clot broke up or got dislodged but nonetheless we want to transport these patients even if the symptoms completely resolve something happened and that patient is forming clots somewhere in the body so if they're not already on a blood thinner their neurologist is probably going to want to put them on one because of that increased risk for the potential um, strokes we also don't want to uh, target strokes or associate strokes with just a single demographic. This isn't just for old people. It's not just for people with high blood pressure or people who are overly stressed. You know, you could have a 25-year-old uh, a that uh, was in a skiing accident and had a surgery to their leg. And as a result of the surgery and the healing process, a clot broke uh, free from one of the um, one of the incisions or something like that and then it causes a stroke. So strokes can occur to anybody uh, at any age, any gender, at any time. So we want to always be aware of those things. When we're assessing for a stroke we're going to do what's called a Cincinnati uh, stroke assessment or what we're using now is something new called BFAST and we'll talk more about those in, uh, in class itself. Uh, so yeah we're going to skip through that for now because I want to do more of the hands-on component with that. And as long as the patient who's having a stroke can maintain their airway, the only thing that we really need to do is rapid transport. Okay, uh, Immediate identification, rapid transport, those are your two most important priorities. Uh, from there then, uh, treat any other signs and symptoms that you recognize and that are in fact treatable by your scope of practice. The other thing though, and, and this is equally important, I will rank this up there with a, you know absolute top priority is we want to find out when the signs and symptoms began to develop or show. We call this the last known well. You absolutely must get this time. And what it is is there are certain clot buster drugs that they can administer in the hospital, but there are very strict time frames in which that drug can be administered after the signs or symptoms begin. So we have to get that information. And sometimes that can be really difficult. And notice, though, that what I want to know is the last time that they were well. I'm not going to ask when the symptoms started. And there's a reason for that. Let's say that we go to a home and a uh, elderly male says that, you know, his wife is acting funny and we identify that this could maybe be a stroke. It's 7 o'clock in the morning and we ask him, hey, when did these symptoms start? Oh, well, they just started when, when we woke up, you know, 10 minutes ago. Well, in fact, those symptoms may have started overnight, right? He didn't notice them until they woke up 10 minutes ago. So that's why it's important that instead of saying that, we would want to say, Sir, when was the last time you saw your, your wife acting completely normal? And his response would probably be, you know, oh, well, you know, she was acting fine when we went to bed last night at 9 o'clock. Okay, so our last known well is at 9 o'clock. And unfortunately, we're going to have to make the assumption that the symptoms could have started at 9.01 p.m. And in that situation, you know, the patient is probably going to be outside the window for the, the clot-busting drug to be administered. Uh, but nonetheless, we have to get that. We have to know when was the last time that the patient was acting entirely normal. Okay? Uh, let's see, what else? When we do have a patient with a stroke, we're going to call in a stroke alert to the hospital. We'll get on the phone and we'll say, hey, you know, this is Scott, you know, ambulance such and such, we're inbound with a stroke alert. And then we'll say, you know, I have a 67-year-old male patient uh, who is presenting with left-sided weakness. He's got left-sided facial droop, uh, unable to, uh, to communicate effectively, showing signs of aphasia. Uh, blood pressure is 192 over 104. You know, pulse is 60. You know, those are things that are supporting the, the presence of the stroke. And the last known well for this patient was at, you know, 1630 hours. And that's the information I want to give over the phone. And as soon as we get to the hospital, more than likely, you'll have the doctor or a nurse that meets you right by the ambulance bay. And they'll escort you straight to CT. You won't even go into the ER. You'll go straight to CT. They'll get scanned right away. 
and the doctor will be able to see that scan and have an idea, is this a, an ischemic stroke or is it a hemorrhagic stroke? And those are the two different types of strokes, by the way. Um, the, the PowerPoint doesn't talk about it, but I'll mention it. So an ischemic stroke means that a clot gets in there, blocks off blood flow, causes ischemia to the tissues of the brain. A hemorrhagic stroke is caused by an aneurysm, where one of the blood vessels in the brain ruptures, causing bleeding outside of the, the brain itself, and uh, it gets out into the, the tissues surrounding it there. Uh, so either one can be equally deadly. Um, you know, they're both going to have consequences. The problem with the aneurysm, though, is that as it continues to bleed, rather than just simply affecting one area of the brain, that bleeding can begin to affect multiple areas of the brain. Dizziness and syncope is something that we, we deal with almost on a routine basis. You know, somebody who felt dizzy and passed out or almost passed out. And there are so many potential causes for this. I mean, I, I can't even begin to list how many potential causes there are for dizziness and syncope. And in those situations, you know, do a good assessment, ask the appropriate questions, get a good set of vital signs. But usually this type of thing uh, resolves itself. Uh, maybe it's from a patient who is dehydrated and they stood up too quickly. And I'm sure we've all you know, had the time where we stood up too fast and we got dizzy for a couple seconds there and then all of a sudden we're good. And all that is is it takes a, a second or two for our blood pressure to register that we just stood up and for our blood pressure to increase a few points to kind of match, match that change. Um, you know, it could be, the dizziness could be related to something as simple as vertigo uh, where maybe they have fluid in their ears. It could be from an infection, an ear infection. Uh, just, again, so many potential uh, causes for this stuff. The term syncope itself just simply means loss of consciousness, and it's a brief loss of consciousness. If they are still unconscious when you get to them, it was not syncope. There's a bigger underlying issue here. You know, loss of consciousness, you know, that would be deemed syncope is going to last maybe a few seconds, not more than a minute or two, and, uh, and that's really it. Some of the underlying causes could be anything related to the circulatory system, cardiovascular disease, uh, cardiac dysrhythmias could be uh, could play into it. General dehydration could be part of it. Uh, drugs or alcohol could cause this. Um, simply having eye issues or or whatever else. Like, again, I'm not going to go through all these different potential causes because there are just countless countless potential causes for it. Uh, when we are assessing a patient that had a syncopal episode, you know, asking them obviously about medical history, how they feel, does anything hurt, you know, what did they feel like before this happened, uh, those are all things that are important to ask. But most importantly is when they did pass out, did they hit their head? Did they fall? Did they get injured? You know, are there any associated traumas that we need to be dealing with at the same time? Uh, and that really takes us to the end. There was a lot there, um, and there aren't you know, a lot of very particular things that we're looking for when we talk about altered mental status. There are you know, potentially hundreds of different causes and signs and symptoms, which again makes this very complex, especially because altered mental status is going to be one of the more uh, severe or serious issues that we deal with with our patients. So do the best you can. Focus more on understanding the causes of altered mental status less on simply memorizing signs and symptoms, and we'll spend a lot of time in class going over the stuff in detail. So thank you very much for listening, and have a great rest of your day.